Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss the US shutdown which has entered the 32nd day today and may continue for much longer. It's the largest shutdown, longest shutdown that has happened. To discuss this with us, we have Professor Ajaz Ahmed who is on Skype from uh, California. Ajaz, this is, must be surprising to most people in the world. Something called a government shutdown. People don't really in the rest of the world understand how a government can be shut down. Of course, not that everything is shut down, the state governments are working, certain sections of the government are shut down, certain other things still probably continue, including the military. But why is there something called a shutdown that takes place in the United States? And now it seems to be taking place periodically between the standoff with the President and the Congress. Yes, uh, yes this is quite a ritual and I can understand that. Uh, people, uh, uh, maybe people outside the United States thinks that, think there is a big deal. It's not. Uh, the, this is the American version of division of power between the executive and uh, the legislature. Uh, unlike most countries, uh, the legislature is not required to pass a budget by a certain date. Uh, <clears throat> A lot of budgetary uh, allocations are voted separately, and so on. So this is this is quite a ritual in the United States, threatening government set, uh, government shutdown by the president, carrying it out for three days, four days, seven days, ten days, something like that. This is the longest. So in that sense, it has become something of a news. But if you pick up, let's say, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post, uh, the main newspapers, look at the headlines, they may or may not carry a story on the front page about the shutdown. So in that sense, it is fairly routine. Um, but behind this whole question of the shutdown in the U.S., um, there is a there, you know, much bigger story behind it. Uh, the, the, by itself, uh, 800,000 uh, U.S. federal workers are affected. 400, roughly 400,000 of them have, have been ordered to report to work without being paid. The other half, half is being advised to uh, get babysitting jobs or whatever, uh, things of that sort. Um, that's 800,000. Uh, it's very bad. But, you know, this is in the context of a country where 80% of the workers, according to the Reserve Bank, the, the, the U.S. Federal Bank, 80% of the workers live paycheck by paycheck. That is to say that if they do miss a paycheck, they cannot meet their obligations. 80%. 80%. 80%. 20% of Americans cannot at any given time put together $400 if there is an emergency. $30 million Americans have no health insurance and there is no health system in the United States without insurance. You know, I mean, the, the kind of country it is you know, the immense capacity of the United States to project itself and have vast majority of the world believe that it is an affluent country, there is, you know, affluence for everyone, etc., etc. It isn't. So 800,000 people not getting a paycheck is not such an extraordinary thing in America to happen. It happens to millions all the time. Uh, and therefore, there's no great agitation. What is extraordinary is that even the, the union of the federal workers, when they try to organize demonstrations, they can get more than 1,000 or two, or two. 
That's even that's interesting. Their own membership, and that also is a comment on the complete destruction of the union movement in the United States. So the organized workers fighting for organized the right of the uh, power simply does not exist. Uh, and that is a very complex matter. I need not go into all that at the moment. So, so far as the shutdown is concerned, there is these kinds of things going on. It's fairly normal for America, uh, for people not to be able to pay their bills and get more debt, more debt, more debt. You know, that's what. So if we but, take... If yeah. I take out the issue of the shutdown itself, which you said yeah. has become a regular ritual now in, yeah. in the government, yeah. in the standoff between the political parties and the president and therefore the, the Congress. If we leave that out, this time it is supposed to be about the wall. And it's also about, supposed to be about immigrants. And Trump has held out the threat that if the Congress does not accede to his demand of uh, allocating X amount of millions of dollars for the or billions of dollars for the wall, then he's going to take actions against the immigrants. And uh, the Democrat senators and congressmen seem to have said that this is hostage taking, that he's taking the immigrants hostage. So do you see this as also part of the larger Trump agenda of anti-migration and bringing that to the it's, it's, a much, it's even much bigger than that. Uh, <clears throat> he has said that he's going to build the wall anyway, even if he has to declare a national emergency. You, you remember emergency? Emergency, of course, as you know, reminds in India, us of India about Mrs. Gandhi's emergency. No, that is what I meant. That's what I meant. In the United States, it's a very peculiar situation. The Constitution does not have the kind of thing that every other liberal uh, constitution in the world has, which is written in the, into the Constitution and uh, 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 the legal right to declare emergency. Uh, it's called, you know, it's called state of siege in some constitutions, whatever. whatever. It's absolutely a constitutional, um, it's, a, it's written in the liberal constitution. So there is a latent possibility of dictatorship within the constitution, which is actually what happened in India at the time of the emergency. Uh, it is within the constitution. Uh, it is the president of India which declares a con quite constitutionally. The emergency. The United States doesn't have that. But what it does have is several hundred statutes on the book passed by the Congress, each one of which gives the president the right to declare emergency for this, that, or the other. But the emergency may be something like uh, a drought or flooding or something. But that gives the president the right to enormous rights. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on about that, but the fact of the matter is that one is this. Um, Trump, uh, okay, th two or three things. You, you said something about me, immigration. It is absolutely true that he has polarized the country on the question, very successfully, on the question of, of uh, migrants. He has been successful at it because from Clinton on, every American president has been screaming about immigrants, illegal immigrants, crime, this, that, and the other. I have a video that I can send you of Clinton saying something which is about 80% as nasty as uh, Trump and so on. So there is a large sort of latent consensus in this country on this issue. Um, Democrat and Republican. I think per uh, year, the US sends back about 200 to 300,000 uh, what it considers as illegal migrants. And this happened under Obama. Obama era. said twice as many as Bush did. Twice as many as Bush did. 
So, you know, it's Democrat and Republican. So he has, Trump has taken it to another level, but it's a very familiar thing in, in America. Uh, so that, 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 there's that. Then you have a situation in which uh, there have been polls saying that roughly 80% of the Republicans are saying that they'll believe anything that Trump says regardless of what news channels or media or anybody might say. If Bush says so, it must be true. So it's a kind of a religious faith. It is, it is charisma of an order that is very hard to match anywhere in the world at the moment. Trump's you know? charisma. Huh? Trump's yeah, charisma, charisma in the Bavarian sense of what the word charisma actually means. Uh, almost a religious belief in somebody's person, person, personality and so on. Uh, where you can get away with anything because you have this um, belief. People have this belief. And so, so he has that. The result is that after 32 days of shutdown, only a mark, something like 55% are against the shutdown, about 45% are not. Uh, on the immig immigration question, all of that. And then what is happening is that Trump is getting more and more and more trapped under the rubric of collusion with Russia. What Mueller and other investigators have done have gone into all kinds of things that Trump and his people have been doing, mostly financial. And the other perjury and various kinds of felonies and various kinds. Uh, and all of that evidence is now building up. So what is he going to do? Is he going to simply stop that investigation? Is he going to get so trapped that he actually declares a state of emergency? Is he going, you know, majority of the Republicans say that if Trump feels that the election of 2020 should be postponed, they would support it. So, you know, this shutdown is being played in this, within this very complex field of internal politics. Um, uh, one more thing and then I'll stop. A new Congress, uh, you know, the House of Representatives, the lower house, uh, the equivalent of our Lok Sabha, has come in. Most of it is the usual Democratic Party uh, nonsense. But there is a small number, about 20 of them, who, uh, who owe nothing to this party so far the election is concerned. They are outside that whole consensus. They are Sanders and further left than Sanders. And they are making an outright bid for places of power within the structure of the, of the Democratic Party. Trump has thrown the gauntlet to them, to Democrats. Are you on our side or their side? And the Democratic Party leadership is caught, and this progressive coalition is on a roll. So part of it is that, these new elections that have taken place. So it's all, all that complicated thing in which shutdown is being played out. So my closing question, again for you to tell us, that is it that the US politics is now entering into a crisis in which fractures of different kinds will become more and more visible, A, and B, is it possible that a leftward shift of the Democratic Party takes place of something equivalent to what happened in UK with the Labour Party, which had with the Blairites gone 
left of the center, right of the center. And with Jeremy Corbyn has now shifted back to a more well-known labor left position. So do you think a similar transition of the Democratic Party is possible or do you think it, that that's not a very likely scenario? You see, Democratic Party has not had that kind of a left wing since the new deal. That is to say, for almost a hundred years, Democratic Party has never had that. Um, organized left party with, you know, um, <clears throat> with a sort of a social democratic yeah. idea of that sort. And what New Deal did for the working class was still very minimal compared to European social democracy. So, uh, so it is not that something that is latent or defeated within the Democratic Party, which is coming back after a decade, two decades, four decades, whatever. It is a very different kind of coalition, uh, an upsurge that is taking place. It is much more on the level of the popular masses, really, a new generational thing. People who had attached their hopes to Obama felt deeply betrayed, rightly so, then attached their hopes to Sanders. Sanders read that moment correctly. And Sanders is um, a social democrat, a New Deal democrat, actually, uh, which is, in terms of Democratic Party, this or the left of it is. And what, he, what Sanders has done very well in America is to constantly be on the move. Small towns, cities, you know, getting their his base consolidated behind the more progressive um, people fighting elections or whatever on their own. Uh, and wherever there is a little victory, uh, it's it gets attached to him. And, and all kinds of very good things. So yes, what is what is what is going to happen is that there is going to be an out and out contest over Democratic Party um, leadership in the coming elections, and that's going to be very bloody, very very bloody. Uh, one thing that is happening is that more newer. Uh, candidates are coming up, you know, declaring their intent to fight for the presidential elections and so on. So for two years before the elections, but this is America, uh, who are adopting that platform. So next time, next elections will be fought. The, the very primaries would be fought on these elections. On a more uh, ideological platform than we have seen yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's going to be a real fight for the soul of the Democratic Party. Yes. Thank you, yeah. Ajaz, for being with us, explaining to us uh, the complexity of the American politics, which is difficult for outsiders to figure out that easily. And yeah, I mean, yeah. had so also, very, it's very parochial, very local. But also the problem is the U.S. politics influences, unfortunately, every other part of the world because of the global yeah. reach of the United States. Yeah. So though we don't have the right to vote in the United States, we still are affected by the consequences thereof. Thank yeah. you very much, Ajaz, to being with us. And we will follow this up now on a regular basis so we get get you on news click as we used to do earlier. Good, very good. This is all the time we have today for news click. Do keep watching news click and our other videos.